Episode number 14. Enjoy. I'm joined today by Dr. Abby Manu Sud, a family doctor and lecturer in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. He directs the Safe Opioid Prescribing Program through Continuing Professional Development at the Faculty of Medicine, which teaches doctors how to prescribe opioids for chronic pain in a safer and more evidence-informed manner. Doc, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Well, listen, can we kick things off with uh, perhaps talking a little bit more about your background and how you got into medicine and working in pain management? Uh, sure. Um, you know, medicine, for me, my, my background actually was primarily in uh, community development and community organizing. And uh, so when I decided to go into into medicine, I, I knew pretty much from the get-go that uh, I, I wanted to be in family medicine. That's the, the area of medicine that really lets you look at uh, communities as uh, or the health of communities as your responsibility. And um, pretty early on, I got some exposure to chronic pain medicine. And uh, what I saw there was that uh, there was a very eclectic approach to the care of people with chronic pain that you don't necessarily see in other areas of medicine. You know, other other areas of medicine can be, um, I would say, I guess, more 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 rote or more uh, perhaps more formulaic. Uh, but in chronic pain, uh, I think it's the, the complexity uh, of chronic pain management um, and that are typical modes of of diagnosis and treatment um, don't work very well in chronic pain that uh, has brought up a lot of different ways of thinking about and approaching and uh, trying to help people who are who are suffering from chronic pain so that's 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 really what attracted me to that area well I mean very well said in that sense of the complexity of it all and, and of course uh, so difficult to just be able to diagnose something or that sort of one pill one fix approach so at the moment, obviously, in the midst of an opioid epidemic, not only in Canada, but seemingly, obviously, in the U.S., the U.K., it seems all over. Um, can you share some statistics with folks to get some some uh, comprehension over the scale of this uh, issue? Uh, yeah, I'd, where, where do we start? Uh, if, we, if we look at Canada, uh, 2016 had about 2,800 confirmed deaths from opioids. Um, and for 2017, we don't have a final number yet, but we're expecting uh, that perhaps to surpass 4,000 people. Uh, we have more people dying from uh, opioid-related harms uh, now than we ever did at the height of the uh, HIV-AIDS crisis in the mid-1990s. And that was, uh, and I say at, at the height of the HIV-AIDS crisis, we don't seem to be anywhere near the height of the opioid crisis. Uh, the, the harms wow. uh, seem, to, seem to be accelerating. Um, I, I think a very scary number comes from the United States where uh, it's estimated that over the next decade or so, about a half a million people will die from opioid-related causes, and that's just a staggering, staggering number. Yeah, it's mind-boggling, especially reading some of these stories about different communities um, in the U.S. and just the, you know, the ravaging effects that this can have. Um, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, you think about that when you when we're talking about death. That's if you think of uh, the the harms from opioid deaths are at the the, the top of the pyramid. And for every death, there's uh, so many other impacts. People who have overdosed, people who whose lives have been affected by uh, by addiction. Uh, so that there are many, many more harms besides just the deaths. I mean, the de the deaths are, of, of course, the most concerning, but uh, uh, the scale is, is is much beyond that. And for folks listening in, Doc, if you know trainers, nutritionists, uh, practitioners who aren't as familiar with the opioid class or even why opioids are so addictive, can you give us a little bit of background there? Sure. So uh, op opioids are a class of um, uh, chemicals uh, that have either are derived from the uh, opium poppy uh, and ultimately from 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 opium, uh, or are structurally similar to uh, the substances found in opium, or have a similar kind of effect on the body. So common opioids that are used in clinical practice include morphine. Uh, codeine, um, uh, hydromorphone, uh, oxycodone, and and fentanyl. Um, and for opioid use disorder, uh, for example, we find things like buprenorphine and methadone that are in common use. 
and of course uh, we see heroin or diacetylmorphine, uh, which is a uh, another kind of opioid that's uh, at this point has a very limited therapeutic use. is primarily used recreationally. And in terms of the the effect on the brain and, and triggering some of the the reward centers of the brain, how is how is how are the opioid class of, of drugs influencing um, you know behavior in that sense? Well, so there's there's two parts to think about. First of all, uh, these opioids have uh, analgesic or pain relieving effects, and um, you know, in a in a world full of uh, uh, injuries and pain, that's a pretty powerful thing to be able to do. And and opioids, in many ways, have 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 changed. I mean, they've they've been with us with uh, with human culture for thousands and thousands of years, uh, used to treat uh, pain. Uh, dysentery, uh, a whole variety uh, uh, of, of conditions in, in, in various forms. Um, and uh, so in, in terms of the pain relieving effects, uh, there are specific what are known as opioid receptors uh, in the body, uh, both centrally, so in the brain, uh, as well as peripherally. Uh, so uh, in, in the, the receptor part of the nervous system. And uh, so that, that's how the, the analgesic effect is mediated. Uh, when we're talking about uh, the development of, so one phenomenon, important phenomenon is, is tolerance, that um, when somebody's exposed to opioids, uh, you either need increasing, over, the, over a long term, you either need increasing doses of opioids to have the same kind of pain relieving effect, uh, or if you stay or stay on the same dose, it'd have less and less of a pain relieving effect. That's the phenomenon of tolerance, um, and is mostly because you get upregulation, as far as we understand, upregulation up of the uh, opioid receptors. So you, you just don't get as much activation from the same kind of dose, and so that's why we often see people. Uh, that that's part of the beginning of uh, developing uh, a dependence, uh, and dependence is really distinct from addiction. Uh, dependence just means that your body is essentially used to having a certain chemical around, and if that's withdrawn, uh, you can get withdrawal symptoms, uh, which is common uh, with opioids but other other therapeutic agents. Uh, addiction is is a different kind of story. Um, uh, addiction is essentially when we continue to use uh, a substance uh, despite uh, it having harmful cons uh, consequences in our life. Um, and uh, that happens uh, relatively commonly with chronic exposure to opioids. There are discussions about how commonly, uh, but part of what drove the opioid crisis initially was uh, this, this false idea that with our, our new kinds of opioids, as represented by OxyContin, that uh, there were very low addiction risks, even though uh, we, we had plenty of evidence that that was not the case. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to think that a lot of these um, chronic pain conditions, whether it's bad backs, arthritis, you know, car accidents, that uh, the prescriptions for the opioid medications are, in fact, you know, sort of driving this in the sense that, as you mentioned, you know, the the idea, the notion that they were going to be so addictive was either underreported or underestimated. Is that correct? Purposely so. Uh, you know, the, the, the big – so um, my, my understanding, my interpretation of the – of this history is that there was uh, a template of for success for the expansion of uh, of opioids that was built um, primarily in the area of palliative care. Uh, that there was uh, this group of people, particularly towards the end of life, uh, that had significant pain needs, and uh, there was a group of physicians uh, or healthcare providers who successfully used opioids to help ease the suffering um, and the pain, the, particularly the pain towards the end of life. And uh, there were both some well-meaning uh, clinicians and academics together with uh, profit-oriented pharmaceutical companies, which saw that as a good template for, uh, for treating uh, what was considered an epidemic uh, of chronic non-cancer pain. So people who had chronic pain but were uh, not dying from an untreatable disease that had a, you know, a foreseeable future of 20, 30, 40, 50 years of life, uh, but had significant debilitating pain. 
And the idea was that we should, um, uh, it's our moral obligation as uh, healthcare providers uh, uh, whose, whose job is to uh, relieve suffering to make use of these uh, supposedly effective therapies uh, uh, of opioids uh, to treat chronic non-cancer pain. And um, uh, that, that in, in many people's eyes, is, uh, including mine, is, is, was the genesis of our current opioid crisis. Yeah, it was startling to me in a, you know, a recent article that you wrote for the Toronto Star how, you know, unlike other um, drugs and medicine that are subject to really high levels of scientific scrutiny, there's, I think most people will be really surprised to find out there's not a lot of really good evidence in terms of long-term you know, randomized control trials demonstrating the effectiveness of opioids, which is you know, a little bit scary. Can you, can you unpack that a little bit more for listeners? Yeah, so you know, we, we we like to believe that we live in a or, or operate in a uh, science-based um, uh, paradigm for healthcare delivery that uses high-quality evidence to make decisions about care, and in some areas uh, that is true. Uh, for chronic pain and opioids, that is really not the case. So there are uh, zero. Uh, long-term studies, uh, and by long-term, I can say a, a year or more, uh, high-quality studies sh- demonstrating the effectiveness of opioids for uh, chronic non-cancer pain. And uh, further to that, uh, just uh, I think now about a month ago, uh, a trial uh, uh, a trial was uh, published looking at opioids versus non-opioids, so strictly pharma- pharmacotherapy for uh, various kinds of arthritis. And the expectation was that, uh, so you know, they took patients and they split, split them up into two different groups. Uh, the group would, one group would get you know, typical uh, uh, opioid therapy uh, starting from a weak opioid like codeine or tramadol. And then as their pain needs Uh, If their pain needs were not met, then they would be stepped up to stronger opioids like morphine or hydromorphone or oxycodone. The other arm of the trial uh, offered uh, pharmacotherapy, but uh, in a stepwise fashion, but did not include opioids. And the expectation was, um, you know, the hypothesis of the investigators was that the opioids would provide better relief. uh, The the people who got opioids would have uh, lower pain ratings but that they would have more adverse effects. But uh, uh, amazingly, and this is really important, uh, what they found was that the opioid group had more side effects, but the non-opioid, had, non-opioid group had, uh, ha- had better pain outcomes. And so we actually have good evidence now um, for uh, uh, osteoarthritis, at least, that uh, we should prefer against, uh, against opioids. Wow, that's uh, that's really compelling stuff, especially in the light of, you know, what happens today. Unfortunately, in a lot of um, doctors' offices, in terms of treating chronic pain, and if we shift this over a little bit into sports, and particularly into contact sports, I know, of, you know, a few years ago in the NHL, there were some tragic cases of, of player deaths with, with opioids combined with heavy alcohol consumption. Can you speak to how that can be a potentially really dangerous combination? So that that's really one of the big things uh, with opioids. So as we've seen this. Uh, big uptick in uh, opioid-related harms and deaths, um, and the majority involve they all involve opioids, but uh, the majority involve other substances, uh, and particularly sedating substances. So sometimes therapeutic and sometimes non-therapeutic. So alcohol is a big one. Uh, benzodiazepines, which are medications used to treat things like sleep and anxiety, are are another big one. And there are also pain medications like gabapentin. Uh, Gabapentin, uh, a recent study demonstrated that people who are on both opioids and gabapentin had about a a two-fold increased risk of overdose as compared to people who are just on opioids. So it it is certainly the combination and different contexts, whether it's uh, it's sports or other kind of social contexts, can increase the risk of exposure to other substances besides opioids. And uh, when we're talking about contact sports, of course, uh, uh, high risk of injury um, and uh, perhaps a lot of pressure to be able to uh, return to play. And uh, there was a time I, I suspect that that's 
uh, that has changed, but there was a time when uh, opioids were considered uh, a, a reasonable way to be able to uh, fight pain, uh, you know, uh, workplace uh, related pain and, and be able to return to work and return to uh, return to sport. Yeah, it's amazing how not too long ago that was definitely um, something that was more readily used. And, you know, in, in our chat before the interview here, we mentioned even on the collegiate level as well, this is something where, you know, especially college football being so popular in the U.S., that uh, the return to play and the pressure to, to perform um, sometimes leads people to, to choosing these alternatives. Um, yeah, choosing the alternatives or uh, maybe even feeling coerced. Um, uh, Probably a better word. <laughs> Give, give, given given all the pressures to uh, perform and and succeed and I, I would say probably beyond that to not being well informed of uh, of the risks um, um, you know we we didn't communicate as a, as a profession um, have not done a good job of communicating with our patients uh, at least historically about the potential risks of, uh, of opioid therapy. And I recently, um, you know, had a chance to hear you speak at the integrative health symposium in 2016 in Toronto. And you, you talked about how, you know, in science we can differentiate between pain intensity, uh, and how much pain is actually bothering you. Um, you actually used a great quote, yoga quote, uh, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Um, you know, how is suffering you know, intertwined in this sort of pain management and chronic pain piece? I, th I think very uh, tightly interwoven, um, you know, as, and this goes back to some of the moral arguments that I referred to earlier about our responsibility as, as healthcare professionals. And, um, you know, I, I think part of our calling is, is really to reduce suffering in, in the world. And uh, pain can be at the root of suffering, um, or it can be a uh, a proximal uh, driver of suffering, but can be distinguished from from the two, and uh, I think that that perhaps is where we lost the plot uh, with respect to chronic pain and uh, with opioids. Um, uh, we we have reasonable suspicion, uh, or we we know that in some circumstances opioids uh, can help to reduce pain, but do they reduce suffering? Is is certainly uh, an open question, and there's no way that I, I'm denying that there are some people, I have patients myself, who have benefited from long-term, and some in some cases, high-dose uh, opioid therapy. Um, so I'm not a uh, quote-unquote opiophobe, uh, but uh, we're trying to bring the balance back. And uh, very interestingly, uh, as our, our, our knowledge of uh, 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 how our mind works and how our brain or nervous system works has continued to evolve. Uh, we, we've been able to find ways to distinguish between uh, pain intensity and pain suffering. We have different measures uh, that can help distinguish between the two. Uh, we know that uh, different regions of the brain potentially mediate um, uh, these two things differently that uh, we, we find different areas of the brain being involved in uh, uh, pain intensity versus pain bothersomeness, which I really equate with uh, the suffering component or the emotional component to pain. For sure. And, uh, you know, in an ideal world, um, or, or what we are called to do is really uh, help with both. And that if we only help with one, um, uh, or particularly help with the one that patients are coming to us with, um, I think there are a lot of people out there who live with pain um, and don't present to uh, healthcare providers. Um, but people, because they're not suffering, um, I think the people who present for healthcare uh, with pain are the ones, the ones who are suffering. And so it is our responsibility really to treat what they're coming to us for and address their, their suffering. Um, and so if we can find ways to do that, um, our, our healthcare system, our patients, our society will, will, will be better off. 
hundred percent. And you know, this is where you know, for me, and I'm sure, I'm sure I've likewise for yourself, this, this, in terms of modalities and things that can support this is obviously you know, meditation, breath work can play a, a, a massive role. You've written here that you know, meditation or folks who meditate have thicker brains compared to pain sufferers. Um, so can you explain that to folks and maybe tell us where we're at in terms of the research on meditation and pain? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think I think one of the very interesting things about meditation, so there, there, there's been, um, I'll, I'll talk about a few things. One is we, we have fairly uh, good quality evidence that uh, various forms of meditation uh, are effective in reducing pain, um, uh, chronic pain specifically. And uh, this is better quality evidence than we than we have for for opioids. Um, and uh, you know, people who have chronic pain um, often there is a suffering component. Often there are associated psychological symptoms like depression or anxiety or insomnia associated with their pain. And so, you know, one question has been asked is, uh, you know, how much does meditation actually improve pain intensity versus all these other things that go together with pain? And we have, uh, again, pretty good evidence that uh, meditation actually reduces pain intensity. So the actual experience of the pain and uh, can impact the uh, psychosocial symptoms uh, and the pain bothersomeness. And so there have been some pretty interesting studies looking uh, more in the acute pain realm, looking at how meditation can mediate these kinds of things. But we can actually distinguish uh, between the pain intensity and the pain bothersomeness and see um, actually how meditation can affect both. One mechanism, and it's an open question what the underlying mechanisms, mechanism or mechanisms mm -hmm. are. Uh, you know, one of them is we do know uh, that uh, the brain is plastic, meaning it can change as a result of experience. And one of the very potent ways of doing that uh, is, is meditation. And interestingly, we find um, uh, there have been some uh, very neat studies looking at long-term meditators um, and, and how their brains compare to non-meditators non or more junior meditators. And uh, as you alluded to, one of the findings is uh, changes in cortical thickness. So a particular part of the brain actually grows in mass um, and uh, becomes larger than it does in non-meditators. In, in non and this is important. I mean, you know, generally, I guess when we think about brain tissue, uh, the more the better, uh, but that's actually not necessarily the case. But what we find is in, in people who have chronic, uh, for example, low back pain, they have, uh, they have cortical atrophy, so in parts of their brain um, that mediate the interpretation of sensation, they actually have less brain mass. And so you see the corresponding right thing happening in people who meditate. They get more brain mass. But there's another area of the brain besides the, the cortex, which is the thalamus. And the thalamus is sort of the gateway of sensation, one really important sensation processing center, not just pain, but all the other senses as well. And in people who have chronic pain, you actually see an increase in uh, activity and mass in, in the thalamus. And, uh, and but in, in long term, in, in, in people who've had some experience with meditation, you actually see less activity in the thalamus. So, um, it, you know, there, it's not just that meditation changes the brain. But meditation seems to change the brain in ways that are highly relevant and important for uh, for the for for the mediation of pain. That's yeah, incredible, incredible stuff. Especially as you mentioned, when you compare it to the uh, the weight of the research on opioids, and you know, for practitioners listening in or folks listening in who are dealing with pain, um, obviously speaking in generalities here, are there certain um, types of meditation or breathwork techniques that you might uh, start with with a, with a client or patient? Um, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic when it comes to uh, what kind of uh, practice uh, so, someone chooses. Um, you know, there, there's uh, literally uh, hundreds or, or thousands of different kinds of practices. And um, I, I think what works best is what somebody is actually going to do. 
Um, and we all have different makeups and constitutions and uh, different things are going to work for different kinds of people. Um, and the important thing is, is actually, actually practicing. So finding a practice that, that, that works for you um, in terms of how your mind operates um, and how your life operates is probably the most important thing. Um, I think another, another good tip is, is having a, a, a good teacher. I mean, if you want to become a great um, healthcare provider, you seek out a great teacher. If you want to become a great musician or a great athlete, uh, teachers have a really important role to play. And meditation is a skill uh, uh, just like those other skills. And having an experienced teacher who can show you the ropes is a, a very, very important part. And having a community of people uh, who are, are engaged in the same kind of practice uh, we know uh, from experience, but also from uh, from uh, from research, is a really important part of a, a, a long term engagement with these kinds of practices. Um, and you know, I, I, I say meditate. I, I think meditation is is very much like sleep. You know, everybody has a different routine. Some people, you know, they like a heavy blanket and the window open. Some people like to wear pajamas. Yeah, some for sure. They like to wear uh, you know boxers or something like that. But once, you know, some people like a pillow, some people like a hard pillow, cervical pillow, no pillow. Uh, but once you're asleep, uh, everybody's sleep is, is, is comparable. And I, I think, I think it's, it's useful to think about meditation in the same way. There are different kinds of practices that can get you to that relaxed awareness state. But everybody, when you're in that relaxed awareness state, it is comparable across people. Um, and, and, and so whatever routine works for you, uh, whatever practice works for you, uh, that's 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 the best one for you, is is my perspective. Yeah, I mean that's a great great insight. I mean definitely for folks who I think you know I've run into a lot of clients or, or athletes for that matter, and, and people who who frankly sort of need to meditate or would benefit greatly from it, but they often say, well, you know I'm not uh, you know, I struggle to meditate or it's 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 too slow for me or they struggle to get into that framework. So I think. Um, as you mentioned, kind of loosening the rules around what people need to do to to allow themselves to to jump into the practice is, is a huge um, getting rid of a huge roadblock or hurdle because I think that's definitely one where people, you know, I've heard the comment I'm doing it wrong many times, and it's uh, yeah. I don't know if you have any comments on that in terms of of some ways of of getting people in the foot in the door in terms of just to try it out whether it's a sh I've heard suggestions around short periods of time just try it for 60 seconds or two three minutes uh, and build it up that way but uh, what, what's your take on that um you know I I I, I, I think um uh yeah I, I, I think there are there, there there are different ways I, I don't know if uh, I, I I I can't say I see an incremental approach working that well at some point you have you have to dive in a little bit um uh to e even if it's a a three-day course um you know and committing th three hours um uh, a day for three days to learn uh, what can be a a, a life transforming skill is not a very big commitment so it really does come down to priorities uh it, you're, you're not going to become a uh, um, a regular meditator if it's not a priority for you and if all you have is 30 seconds to to uh, give towards it you, you, it's probably not going to become an important part of your life um, just like if you give 30 seconds to learning to play the piano you're probably not going to be become a, a very regular or good piano player um, so you know I, I, I don't think there are there are really shortcuts um, I, I do think that is something that anybody can do. Uh, I, I don't think there's you know anybody out there who's incapable uh, of meditating. So if that's a block in somebody's mind, uh, certainly cross that uh, off the list. You, you can cross that off the list. It's something that comes very naturally to us. We have all uh, been in a meditative state at some point in our life. Um, you know whether it's uh, it may be something as simple as uh, uh, listening to a beautiful piece of piece of music where you get lost in the music. And you feel sort of beyond yourself, or bigger than yourself, or you're you get lost watching uh, watching the sunset. Um, we, we've all had that that feeling of being in a meditative mindset, um, or even you know uh, sometimes uh, on the way to sleep, uh, where you're totally relaxed, but there's some sense of awareness. 
we, 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 we all have the ability. It's, it's inbuilt within us. So, uh, yeah, you can certainly cross that, that barrier off the list, but then you, I think you do have to put in some, some time and some effort, uh, to be able to, uh, become effortless. <laughs> Absolutely. And in terms of, you know, if someone is to jump into a course or do a more uh, intensive train to acquire those skills, is there a, um, you know, a certain target in terms of a uh, number of sessions in a week or time in a week that people could shoot for in those, again, initial stages when they're trying to make some of the gains that you've, you've talked about? Every single day. I, you know, I, I, it's not a huge time commitment, but uh, 20 minutes. If you can commit 20 minutes every single day uh, over the course of uh, three months, uh, you will uh, you will get the hang of it. Terrific. That's uh, great advice. And, you know, curious as well in terms of, you know, on the training front, if somebody commits to a certain program and achieves a new level of fitness or strength, you know, to maintain that level of strength or fitness doesn't take nearly the amount of effort as it did to get there. You know, they can reduce the, the frequency of training and even the, the duration to, and maintain a lot of those gains. Would you say with meditation, once somebody's achieved a level of whether it's three, four, six months a year um, in terms of the timing, or is it still best to, to just kind of maintain that regular 20 minute practice? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, that, uh, that, that 20 minutes uh, a day for three months will get you regular and, uh, I think once you've done that in your life, it'll be, like you said, it'll be uh, very easy to slip back into it. But uh, that's really just the beginning. I mean, meditation is, is, is exhilarating. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. It's, you know, it's, once, you've ex once you've experienced um, how big or how um, uh, wondrous our own, your own mind is um, and your own consciousness is, uh, hey, I, I think I think it'll be hard to to let let that go. Um, it's it, it's something that that will keep drawing you back again and again. Fantastic, Doc. Well, listen, terrific, terrific insights here on a really complex topic. And you know, before we wrap up, I want to ask you a couple questions on the personal side of things. Uh, I like to ask my guests around you know personal routines, morning routines. So for yourself, in terms of a, a morning routine, or perhaps on the meditation side, you know, what types of practices do you like to incorporate? Um, so I, I have a, a, a pretty regular um, uh, routine. So uh, when I wake up in the morning, uh, the first thing I will do, you know, after showering and stuff, I will uh, do a, a breathing practice called Sudarshan Kriya, uh, which is a rhythmic breathing practice, um, uh, which takes advantage of a very natural uh, inbuilt uh, breathing rhythm that takes your mind to a meditative state and um, very easily. So it, it's quite amazing because uh, no matter what state of mind you may be in, tired, frazzled, stressed, happy, uh, Sudarshan Kriya will take your mind uh, to meditation. So then I'll meditate. And then typically um, at lunchtime, I will meditate again for, for 20, to, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and that's, that's the bulk of my, uh, of my practice. I have a pretty busy um, uh, professional life and, and home life. Uh, two little kids, so uh, if uh, well, maybe when they're a little bit older, I'll probably uh, uh, take more time to meditate as well. Fantastic, and I know um, you know you're a big basketball fan as well. Have, have you always been a, a lifelong Raptors fan? I'm sure your sons are, are getting into basketball as well this time. Uh, so we took our sons to uh, a Raptors game about two months ago. They're my boys are five and three, and uh, and they loved it. Um, and they've been talking about the Raptors ever since. Um, and so they got some Raptors gear as well. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big basketball fan. Um, and uh, one of my favorite Raptors uh, used to be Bismack Biombo. Nice. And, uh, partly because you know he he had a certain presence. And he had a certain aura and positivity about him. And I, I think anybody who encountered him or watched him play uh, could see that. And I, I just knew something. I, I, I knew something was up with him. And then I, partway through his tenure as, as a Raptor, uh, it was around Christmas time the story came out that, you know, he's been for, for, for the previous six months or a year, maybe even longer, uh, he had uh, built up a regular meditation practice. 
and uh, I just knew it, you know. So it, it, you, you, you can sometimes you can see it. People have who have been meditating for a long time. They have a certain uh, shine to them, a certain bounce to them. And uh, I guess when you've been meditating for a long time, you can pick it out. And it was, awesome. it was nice to get that uh, that confirmation from the. Uh, I think it was a Toronto Star story that I saw. Ah, oh, terrific! That's fantastic. Well, listen, wrapping things up here. You know, if you had to give someone listening in, a client practitioner, you know, a piece of advice on uh, on meditation, sort of that twenty percent of the fundamentals to get them eighty percent of the way home, uh, what would that be? Um. I'll, I'll, I'll give you, um, so my, my, my spiritual teacher has uh, um, some very simple uh, golden rules for meditation. Um, I want nothing. Um, I, <laughs> uh, I am nothing. And I do nothing. And, and you can remember those. Uh, prior to meditating, prior to sitting to meditating, and uh, those, those those free you up, those free up your mind uh, from all the different uh, activities and modulations that they're going through. So I do nothing, I want nothing, I am nothing. Terrific, fantastic advice. Really appreciate you taking the time here, Doc. You know where can people stay connected with you and keep up with all your terrific work? Um, at doc, D O C underscore sued S U D. That's my Twitter handle. And that's where I, um, uh, you'll hear a lot about both, uh, meditation and opioids, uh, uh, through that handle.